Hi, I'm Elvis Wilson and welcome to Page to Screen, where we explore the art and craft of screenwriting and filmmaking. The show is a production of the Tennessee Screenwriting Association. For more information about the TSA, visit us online at www.tenscreen.com or follow us on Facebook. I'd like to thank our members uh, who turned out tonight in the audience. Thank you very much. Our studio crew here who makes all this possible. We couldn't do this without you. So joining us tonight on Page to Screen is screenwriter, author, and teacher, Stephen Womack. Stephen? Elvis Gray, it's good to see you. Uh, Thank you very much. It's great to be doing something with the TSA again. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, many of us here tonight are familiar with your work, but for our viewers at home and um, Let's go back in time. Let's uh, hear the Stephen Womack backstory. <laughs> well, I'm a rare bird in 21st century Nashville. I'm a Nashville native. Um, I was born here in a long time ago um, in the 50s and 60s and then went away to college and was a newspaper reporter for a while and uh, started writing at way too early an age. I had absolutely no life knowledge or anything, but I, I compulsively wrote even as a teenager and uh, got out of college in the 70s um, and attempted a journalism career just as journalism began to die as a viable career path. And um, um, so eventually morphed into working in publishing, worked in publishing in Nashville for a while, worked in New York City and the whole time I was collecting rejection slips and writing unpublishable novels and uh, trying to learn how to do this. And, uh, and then it came back to Nashville in the 80s um, thinking that I'd stay for a few months and I've been here ever since. And uh, writing novels, screenplays, um, uh, we can uh, talk about this a little bit later about screenwriting, but uh, that was sort of a pivotal moment for me is when I took up screenwriting. And uh, I think every writer needs to study writing for film. It'll make you a better writer in anything else you do. And now, you know, in the mid 90s, when uh, the first film school in the state of Tennessee um, uh, started here in Nashville, um, they hired me as a faculty member and I spent the next 25 years there. Can you talk a bit about the differences between writing a novel and writing a script? They're very different mediums. Very different skill set, very different muscle, um, very different mind frame, mindset. That you have to remember that the strength of the novel is its ability to get into the inner lives of the characters. That you can, um, in, a, in a novel, you can, you can uh, tell us what a character's thinking, what they're feeling. You can give us backstory and exposition. And of course, you know, you don't just stop the story and do it, but um, a good skilled writer can dive deep into a character's consciousness and explore it in ways that you just can't do in film. Um, I, you know, the novel that made me want to become a writer, um, I was forced to read it in high school. I didn't want to read it. It turned out to be one of the best books I've ever read, which is Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men. In the middle of Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men, he takes a 150 page segue into a Civil War story. You could never do that in a movie. In fact, the two movie adaptations that have been done of All the King's Men eliminated that part of the book altogether. So, you know, you have to remember that, that, that that's the strength of the novel, but when you go to writing for film, you have to remember that um, if, if the film is a visual medium, it tells stories through the visual. So you can't, you have to find, if you want to tell us that a character is afraid or anxious or haunted by the death of their grandmother 20 years earlier. You can't just stop the movie and explain that to the audience. You've got to find a visual representation of it. So um, as I used to tell my students, that $60,000 red camera that's on that C stand over there that you're all so blown away by is actually just another dumb effing box. It can only record what you put in front of it. So when you're writing a screenplay, if it, if it can't be recorded by a microphone or filmed by a camera, it doesn't belong on the page. 
Um, and Do you have a favorite genre that you like to write? Uh, geez, I've written in several. Um, I've written in crime fiction, uh, mystery, suspense, thrillers. I've written a, a comic parody of a of a horror novel, of a vampire novel that's out there making the rounds right now. Uh, I've done a sappy Christmas movie. Um, and in a way, that's um, the beauty of writing for film, is you get to dip your toe into all kinds of different stories. Have you tried We're, to adapt I this have. into I, I a have. screenplay? Yeah. In, in TV fact, series or a feature? Well, um, the work I've done has been, I've adopted, adapted a couple of them to feature. And the, the first one of these books, which came out in 1994, was, um, was really one of the first mysteries ever set in Nashville, Tennessee. And this is the first series ever set in Nashville. Na nobody really thought of Nashville like LA or New York or Chicago or, you know, Miami, the setting of a mystery. And I yeah. thought when I started writing this, why not? Nashville's as crazy and full it's of great. flavor as they are. Before it was It City. And before it was an It yeah. City. And the first book in that series was called Dead Folks Blues. It introduced Harry James Denton. And shocker of shockers, it won an Edgar, yes. uh, which is awarded by the Mystery Writers That's of America. That's how I found your book. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. if you're, if, yeah. if you're, if you write mysteries, the Edgar That's is the equivalent of, of an Oscar. Wow. And so those, those books were uh, under continuous option uh, for film or television for about 15 years. Well, I am sad they never, they ne well, never saw the light, but never maybe they did, but still hoping. Yeah. Uh, and at one point, I've, I've, uh, they were optioned by independent producers who had no money and no resources and basically were friends of mine, so I gave them the option for a while. All the way up to Michael Mann held the option on him for wow. three wow. years. Yeah. I mean, he renewed it a couple of times. It's very cool. But that was back in the 90s when episodic P.I. was really dead. Um, uh, this was when other police procedurals had taken over. Um, you know, that um, really, uh, what's the one set in Hawaii? Uh, Hawaii Five-O. Hawaii five -O. no, yeah. Magnum P.I. Magnum P.I., okay. The Tom Selleck. Yes. Magnum P.I., which has now been rebooted, um, was really the last episodic P, you know, the 70s and the 80s were, you know, you had Magnum P.I., you had uh, the one with James Garner, Rockwell, the uh, Rockford Files. It was sort of the golden age of televised P.I., sure, yeah. and I miss that. I do too. So, so um, let's talk about another kind of book. Um, there are so many books out there now about screenwriting. Some of them are good, and some of them are not so good. Uh, which books uh, do you recommend uh, to these beginning screenwriters well, out here? There's there's a ton of rich, wonderful material out there that that will help you learn. And, uh, and part of it is, as I used to joke, and we used to joke in the faculty at Watkins. You know, in many ways, the teaching of screenwriting has become a bigger business than screenwriting. In our pre-interview uh, with you, uh, you said, I'm a Robert McKee yeah. writer. What did you mean by that? Well, um, I d when, when I took Rick's first course about the only uh, book out there. Uh, his book is on story. It's like a classic. Yeah, but yeah. when I first put, took my first screenwriting class, the only book out there really that I could ever find was Sid Fields. Right. And Sid Fields' right. books are still out there, and it was a good place to start. I found Sid's books to be a, a little leaning towards a little formulaic. Sure. You know, down to, you know, specific page numbers. Things had to happen. And then I took, um, I went to Northwestern University up in Evansville for a three-day, uh, Robert McKee's three-day story structure weekend. And... Um, I, it's hard to describe what a game-changing, life-changing event that was because um, uh, McKee, uh, I took a spiral notebook thinking, I'll take a few notes, right? I came back from that weekend with 80 pages of notes. Wow. I scribbled the entire spiral notebook, rolled it over and filled <laughs> up the back pages yeah. and came back. Sounds like you were inspired. I felt like I'd been yeah. pulled through yeah. a keyhole. 
And, uh, you know, Robert McKee um, uh, was a character. He, 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 he Larger did. than life. Right? Well, but he didn't, uh, yeah. he was not in the movie adaptations, but there was a Bob McKee, somebody portrayed him. Uh, and I had to, ex I explained to my students, uh, they had to tone him down for the movie adaptations. <laughs> yeah. He was actually yeah. a much bigger prick <laughs> than right. that. He would yell at people. Yeah, sure. And, you know, people were afraid to talk to him. But I, I learned a lot. And then I went on, there what was Bob McKee. Yeah, okay. And then... Some um, of the other books? Huh? Yeah, I yeah. tried to yeah. read... Uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces because I'd seen the 12, 14 part documentary that Bill Moyers did on him. Hero with a Thousand Faces is an academic book and, and Joseph Campbell was an academician. Sure. So that book's tough slogging. Yes. But he had a student, Campbell had a student who went into the movie business and I hope I'm remembering this story right, Chris Vogler. He right. went to work for either Disney or Paramount as a, as a reader. I mean, entry-level position. He's reading scripts. And because he had studied under Joseph Campbell and really understood mythic structure, he figured out the scripts that are really good are kind of all good for the same reason. And the scripts that are really bad are all kind of bad for the same reason. So he wrote a guide for his colleagues in this development department, and um, that evolved into Chris Vogler's The Writer's Journey, which is now in about its fifth or sixth edition, what and about, it's the best. What it's about the, best. the uh, Save the Cat series? Uh, what do you think Snyder, of those? Uh, Blake, Blake Snyder, Snyder, Save Blake the Snyder. Cat, that's yeah. a great one too. Yeah. Uh, I just took a webinar um, the, the, on, on how to apply the Save the Cat principles to writing novels. And they work just as well, they transfer. And really what it is, this is what I've been teaching, I taught 25 years at Watkins, I taught another four or five years at some other schools, I taught adjunct at Vanderbilt, taught adjunct at Belmont. I've never written my own book about writing because th those three books, um, this, they're, they're all about underlying story structure. And the story structure is universal. So the books are in, and this is not a criticism, but the books are all saying the same thing. Right on. So yeah. when Bob McKee talks about the inciting incident and David Trottier, who wrote the Screenwriter's Bible, talks about the catalyst, they're, they're the really same the thing. same event. Something that we, we talk a, a lot about in the TSA is uh, uh, you learn by reading a lot of screenplays. Mm -hmm. But I, when I started out, um, really, there were a few basics that everybody had to read. Chinatown, right? Robert Towns' Chinatown. He really revolutionized the way screenplays are written. He invented the secondary slug. Um, others, you know, uh, Larry Kasdan's Body Heat. I taught that for years to these guys at Watkins. Um, D Die Hard is a script that hits its marks beautifully, whether you like the movie or not. And sometimes I, t I, tell, I, I tell my students, sometimes you can learn a lot from a bad movie. Yeah. Uh, you taught screenwriting for, you said 25 years. That's a yeah. long time, right? So I bet you've seen it all. Uh, can you share some of the bad habits or mistakes that you've seen students making over and over again? We're all guilty of making these mistakes. Yeah. Let's touch on some uh, of the most obvious uh, ones. I used to have some rubber stamps made up um, and, and or rubber stamps in Adobe because I was reading scripts online for a while. NVE. Non-visual yeah. exposition. Very good. Yes. Don't start your screenplay by giving me the the protagonist's life story, right? Um, Will Akers, another one of your guests and a very good friend of mine. Will and I were talking about this one day. How student scripts tend to over-describe everything, and uh, Will wrote told me once that he got this script from a student that was a page and a half of the description of the college student's apartment with, <laughs> with the, the yeah. cigarette butts, the overflowing yeah. ashtrays and the records and the milk cartons and the, and the dirty pizza cartons laying around. And he took a red pen and w waxed out the whole script and wrote in a 
the apartment. <laughs> and, th yeah. and that, That's you know, great. that did it. Yeah. So over describing non-visual exposition. Yeah. And of course, all film students it, love the technical yeah. stuff. They love the right. camera stuff. So um, uh, I, this was really hard because they, and they all wanted to be directors. The vast majority of film students love to write, but they really want to direct. So they're directing from the page. Right. They're calling out camera angles. They're they're giving camera instructions, uh, uh, editing instructions, and that that's that's a hard thing to get across. That Craig, Craig Mason would say that there are no rules. Whatever gets it read or makes it the easiest to read. What, what, what do you feel That's about that? That's a self-contradictory statement. Yeah. Because there are, th if there are no rules, then they'll read anything. Yeah. There are things that you can put in a script that will cause people to throw them away on page right. one. They can do it. Um, you know, I, early on, I got this great, fabulous screenwriting assignment, freelance assignment, writing a series of educational videos for um, uh, uh, the Learning Technology Center at Vanderbilt. And these were short, 30-page scripts. I could knock them out in a couple of days. They paid me a ton of money. They were great to work with. But the first one I did, I threw in camera angles, close on, dissolve, you know, all these. And we were doing a table reading, and the director slammed the script down, and I, I'll, I'll clean it up a little bit. He said, don't tell me to w put my expletive deleted camera. Don't tell me where to put my right, camera. Right. And that stayed with me for the re has stayed with me ever since. It's, it, don't confuse the screenwriter's job with the director's job. Um, I think it's great to take something short that, you, that you've written and shoot it, even if it's on an iPhone. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what, I, I find like I economize space and how I uh, write action just by having that experience. What would you say to uh, students about that kind of experience? Um, it's invaluable. Yeah. It teaches you, um, and that's the reason I don't make films, is that I got involved early on in some student films at Watkins back in the 90s, and I took a production class at Watkins just so I could say I had taken it, and that convinced me, and I, I used to joke, I'm the only screenwriter on, the er on earth who doesn't want to direct, never wanted to, because it's hard work and right. it's expensive and it's time consuming. But and, you learn so much. Oh, you learn so much. And, but as I think my students would say, that you, where you learn is you learn from your mistakes. Aim high and then don't get it. So you've got to figure out, uh, okay, it's, um, you know, I, I just lost my B camera and the rain's coming in. We just lost our light and, and uh, the sound recorder's called in sick today. How am I going to get any footage shot, right? Right. So that's, that's, that's how you learn, down in the trenches. We have some uh, aspiring uh, writers here tonight, and it looks like they're chomping at the bit to ask <laughs> you some questions. So um, let's hear what they have to say. Sure. Hi, I'm Anna Maria. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I Thank have a real you. simple question. You've written a lot of books. Other people have written books, and they want to like adapt it to the film. What's your advice? Well, the, the thing you have to remember, and when it comes to adapting books for film and film for books, I've gone both ways. Mm -hmm. Don't pull that out as a sound bite. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've, I've done novelizations of feature film scripts, mm -hmm. and I've done uh, screenplay adaptations of novels. And the thing you have to remember is, as the writer, mm -hmm. uh, the question always comes up, what do I owe to the original novelist in terms of faithfulness to the plot, uh, integrity to the story, preserving the characters. The thing that you have to remember above all else is that you owe absolutely nothing to the, to the original writer of the novel that you're adapting. You don't owe anything to him. Your only obligation is to the audience and to make a good screenplay for a movie. So history is full of, of great novels that were gutted in film and still made good films. Um, I was talking to Elvis b earlier about um, the, the Howard Hawks 1944 adaptation of 
Ernest Hemingway's To Have and Have Not. And it's a great movie and it's a great book. How much of the book made it into the movie? The title. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway's To Have and Have Not is on the poster. That's all Hemingway contributed to that, to the novel. The character that was Lauren Bacall is not even in the novel. They changed the war. It was a different war in, in, to have, in the novel. It was a different plot line, a different location. So you owe nothing. Um, your only obligation is to write um, a, a script that can be filmed. And sometimes, you know, you run into, we were talking earlier about the great mystery novelist Sue Grafton, whom we lost a few years ago. Um, I knew Sue. And mm. she told, she spoke publicly that she came to writing novels out of the TV industry. And she knew what TV and film did to novels. It's, it was in her will that her and her, the people who inherited her estate could not sell it to the movies. I mean, she, she prohibited that from the grave. So to the best of my knowledge, there'll never be a Kenzie Milhone movie. Wow. Because she didn't, for one thing, she didn't need it. Right. <laughs> so, and, and, that, and again, what we said earlier, everything in the, in the script has got to be visual. So <laughs> long segues and backstory and exposition, Hack it away. All right. All right, my name is Carlton Atkins, and I am one of Steve's former students. And uh, one of the things I remember, Steve, you would say to us all the time is, especially given the, uh, what you talked about, this, the page and a half of describing the uh, uh, apartment, was that you can get into a scene quicker and get out of a scene quicker than you think you can. Yeah. And um, not that you have to say this about me, but I do have a question about what makes a good screenwriting student. Somebody who's got passion for the process. Man, I tell you, I loved it. Um, and y Carlton, you were one of them. I remember you from, the, from Watkins in the early days of the film school, is you just had a drive for it. And, and when I found a student, as, as these guys over here, who just lit up when they talked about screenplays and when they talked about movies and, and they, you know, they, they eat, lived and slept it. And I, I loved it when over my whole teaching career, I loved it when a student would get in my face. <laughs> you know, yeah. I loved it when students argued with me because I'm, I'm not I'm not the god of screenwriting. I'm not the formatting police. Um, you know, I would go I would send a script back to a student and say, you know, you can't do that. That's not in Trottier's The Screenwriter's <laughs> Bible. You can't format that way. And he would bring me an Aaron Sorkin script where Sorkin had gotten away. So how do you argue with that, you know? And so that's really it. You, it's the, it, what sustains you as a student, but it what sustains you as a writer and a filmmaker as well. This is a tough business. It is a hard row to hoe. And the only thing that keeps you going is your love for it and your passion for it. And yes, you can um, almost always get into a scene later than you thought and get out quicker than you thought. Mm -hmm. That's something Rick Reichman taught me. <laughs> hey Steve, uh, my name is Josh Winters. I'm one of your former students. How are you doing? One of my best ever former students. <laughs> Uh, I think it was Hemingway who said something to the effect of uh, all writing is rewriting. Right. About how many drafts do you think it takes to, to, to complete a script? Well, actually, I normally get it right the first time out. So, <laughs> uh, no, it, it takes as many as it takes. Um, with my novels, for some reason or other, um, I write, I rewrite as I go along. So for one thing, you lose track of how many times you've rewritten it. And, but also, and I'm not being too flip, by the time I get a novel finished, it's in pretty good shape because I've been rewriting it the whole time. And then it's two, three, four more passes after that and it's done. Screenplays I don't even keep track of, but no, it is uh, more than novel writing, more than short story writing, anything. In film, screen, screenwriting is rewriting. So knocking out that first draft is the fun part. And then you get down in the trenches. And um, I've done, I know I've done as many as 15, 20 drafts on a script. Like I say, I don't, I don't keep track. Um, but I've had people I've worked with, um, there was a, 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 a guest speaker at Watkins once um, who runs a production company out in LA. 
and I, you know, I, I knew him, and I said, well, what are you working on? And he mentioned this script. Well, this was the script he was working on the last time I talked to him a year and a half earlier. And I said, how many drafts have you got? He said, 128. <laughs> and I went, okay, I, you know, I sometimes wonder if at some point, um, there's, a, there's a writer and filmmaker here in town, Coke Sams. Oh, yeah. And I, you know Coke. Oh, yeah. Uh, Coke spoke to the film writing students, at, uh, spoke to the filmmaking students at Watkins once, and he was talking about how you never finish a script you abandon it. <laughs> you just abandon it. And he's right. At some point, you know, and I go back to stuff I wrote 10, 15 years ago. Sometimes it's been published. Occasionally it's been produced. And I go, oh, man, I wish I could change that. I wish I could redo that over. So great question. Yeah, but it's true. You're going to rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Stephen, on behalf of Page to Screen Thank and the you. Tennessee Screenwriting Association, uh, you have a standing invitation to come visit us anytime. So uh, we'd love to have you back. And uh, I don't want to bury the lead here, but thanks for helping make TSA exist in the first place. Oh, so, my, my yeah. pleasure. It was an honor. Yeah. Thank you, Elvis. Yeah. This was great. Yeah, thanks this for great. It. Thank you. Yeah. To find out more about the Tennessee Screenwriting Association, including our meeting schedule and programs, or to become a member, we'd love to have you as a member, visit us online at www.tenscreen.com or check us out on Facebook. We meet uh, online through Zoom every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central. Make a note of it, except the last Wednesday of every month where we meet here in the studio. Stephen, do you have any final words, any sage wisdom to throw out there to the uh, multiverse? Okay. Um, in many ways, we're living in a, in a golden age of, for writers. Uh, with streaming services and cable and so many outlets, there's more demand for content than ever. With the indie publishing movement now, there are more small presses and independent presses than ever. You don't, the gatekeepers, don't matter anymore, that anybody can get into print, anybody can write scripts and get them out there. And that, that being said, in many ways, the business has become more complicated and difficult than ever, um, more competitive than ever. So it's critical for young writers to learn the business as well as learn the craft, learn how the business works, network, join groups like the TSA, go to conferences, read the books, study, become an informed business person. And I hate that word, <laughs> but an informed business person as well as an artist because the two are go hand in hand and they're more critical than ever that you, that you learn it, you learn the business. Glad you were here. Thank you. Right. Thank you.